Welcome, ev welcome everybody to another Voices with Rebecca. I'm very excited about this uh, because it's always, and I uh, and I hope Mark takes this in the spirit that it's offered. Um, it's uh, right. It's always wonderful to meet with one of my former students and now current colleague. Um, I have something analogous to a parent's pride, if that's if that's allowed, without it being demeaning or condescending. I mean, I mean it uh, as a compliment. Um, and um, you heard me mention. Professor Mark Miller before. Um, for those of you who are interested, he, his name comes up quite a bit, especially in the video, and I'll put a link into this uh, in this description. Um, the video I did with uh, Brett Anderson on the work that Mark and Brett and I are doing, integrating relevance realization theory with predictive processing theory, especially the 4E COGSI version of predictive processing. And, and Mark is a pivotal figure in that uh, in many ways. Um, but I'll let him now introduce himself and say a little bit more about he, himself and his work and how his work and my work uh, join together and what we might talk about today. And then I'll, I'll do a basic framing and then we'll get into it. So take it away, Mark. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, John. And no, it's not, it's not belittling at all. I love, I love the fact that I was your student and um, you, were, you were my favorite professor at the time that I was doing my undergraduate at University of Toronto cognitive science class. And I think a lot of my inspiration for even doing this as a career came from attending your class. So it is so cool to come back so many years later and get a chance to work with you. So no, that's great. Um, yep, hi everybody, I'm Mark Miller. Um, I'm a new assistant professor at the University of Hokkaido. Um, they have a fantastic new center called the Center for Human Nature, Artificial Intelligence and Neuroscience. And the department is really, I think, the way that research should be going. I mean, I'm a bit biased because of the kinds of things I'm interested in, but the whole spirit of the department is to bring together um, philosophers and neuroscientists and machine learning researchers and have them be consistently collaborating on topics that are specifically about human mental well being, consciousness, um, virtue. Um, if you check out our running page on the center, I mean, uh, it's very rare that you find a department that sort of advertises upfront while we are super multidisciplinary and we really care about human issues like human problems, but also how can we be thriving as humans. So it's a, it's a fantastic department. Um, I just started here this year. Um, previous to this, I think you know, John, I was part of Andy Clark's, that was right. my postdoc. I was with Andy Clark on his uh, XPEC project, looking at um, predictive processing and consciousness for the last few years. Um, maybe I could say a little bit about what I do generally too. Please, so, please Mark, uh, just for everybody's uh, please. note, um, uh, Andy Clark is considered one of the seminal figures in uh, cognitive science, especially what's called third generation or 4E cognitive science. Um, I've met Andy, uh, I think once or twice in person, um, deeply influential on my work. Some of you have heard me, you know, use his phrase, natural born cyborgs. And one of the things about Andy Clark's work is he, he represents exactly what Mark is talking about, that deep interpenetration between psychology, philosophy, cognitive science, machine learning. And he very much represents what I would call the big picture model of cognitive science, rather than working on, I'm not denigrating this, but rather than working on sort of specific problems, Andy is very much, and this is something I believe I share with Andy, trying to create a big picture uh, uh, understanding of the mind and cognition, just so people yeah. know uh, Andy's background. So please continue, Mark. Yeah, that's dead on. And I was really fortunate to work with Andy for almost 10 years. I did, um, he was my advisor for my master's in 2010 at the University of Edinburgh, and I got to work with him up through my PhD and into my postdoc, which was really very fortunate. Um, right, so then I do predictive processing as well. Um, the end of my master's project, uh, I had a small chapter on predictive processing. That's when it was just sort of becoming uh, an interesting um, theory to start thinking about. And, uh, and then I ended up devoting my PhD to um, seeing where we can bring together the predictive processing or active inference framework with the 4E cognitive science world. That's what I did for my PhD. And then of course the postdoc was then taking that work and uh, especially I'm interested in um, emotion and affectivity uh, as it plays out in embodied cognitive science and how active inference and predictive processing can tell us something about that. I ended up using that to discuss consciousness. And now here in Japan, I'm building on top of all of that to start thinking about um, what can we learn about 
uh, human flourishing, in particular happiness, well-being, wisdom, um, using this rich suite of computational tools that we get from predictive processing and active inference, and, uh, and especially how it's related to um, all of the embodied cognitive science stuff. So that's what I'm working on today. That's fantastic. Yeah. So um, a couple uh, uh, further things. Uh, you know, you and I have also been talking both with Brett and uh, uh, just together about you know using this framework and integrating it with some of my work uh, to yeah. talk about altered states of consciousness like flow, uh, yeah. insight, uh, maybe experiences of self-transcendence, mystical experiences, and how, what how they might be understood from this framework. And not and explained, not explained away, but explained and explained in a way that may help to explain both their phenomenology and their functionality and why they contribute to adaptivity and also to flourishing. And so that's a part I think maybe we can get into uh, uh, today. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. You know, um, we, we are excited, the team that I work with are excited about this suite of computational tools from active inference because the way that we approach it, you very much can find a sort of bridge between phenomenology and computation. Yep. And that's a uh, that's nice when you're thinking about things like altered states because it might give you some it gives you some ground to start thinking about exactly like you say the beneficial or unbeneficial qualities of those states. So we have a paper out um, just last year called "Losing Ourselves," which mm. looks at the euphoric and devastating family members of selfless experiences, right? Right, So, yeah. you yeah. know, they're, they're selfless experiences, but they're not, all, they're not all of the same quality. You know, there are really devastating dissociative disorders, DPD yep. and DPR. Personalization disorder, yep. Exactly. Yep. And, then, yep. and then you have, of course, the Buddhist uh, meditative contemplative program where you're really aiming to try to have um, selfless states. And then, um, I don't know if you've seen this recently, but it's kind of a... It's kind of an interesting, popular approach. I'm completely against it, but it, it's showing up, which is the yeah. idea that maybe maybe they're identical. Maybe the uh, selfless states that we find through contemplative programs and disassociative disorders, well, maybe they were just the same thing. Maybe the Buddha was just sort of dissociated, and that's, yeah. that's what he was talking about. Because if you look at the quotes, um, I've given a talk on this relatively recently, and you can pull quotes out of the Buddhist family yeah, of, of yeah. teachings, and they are identical to the ones that you find with people with disassociative disorders, but there is a major difference. One creates an experience of liberation, all of these positive affective qualities, more control, more agency in a way. Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. there, there's, you know, that has to be taken with a, with a grain of salt and really understand what agency means. But in the other one, you have devastating outcomes. You know, people are really not doing very well. And so, so the question then is, are they the same? Are they different? If they're different, why are they different? And what are the practices and um, situations and contexts that creates the difference between these two? And um, by looking at these through the lens of active inference, we were able to hypothesize some cognitive mechanisms that underlie them. And then the beautiful thing was that you know, if you if you buy our story, and I think it's a pretty good story to tell, um, then you see that actually they're opposite cognitive mechanisms. They're actually oh, wow. on either end of a polaric scale. Um, they're really they're not they're not at all similar in any way. Yes, the phenomenology is the same. Potentially, it, the phenomenology shares some qualities, but actually the cognitive mechanisms that lead there are completely different. So um, yeah. it makes it makes sense of why it sounds like they're the same, but they tend to be very different. So this Important. is so exciting. So this is so exciting, and, and I hope like, I, I'm going to make a request that we make this this topic maybe a focal topic for this discussion. Yeah, one I of, love that. One of the things uh, you can all see is that Mark is deeply interested in mindfulness and uh, the mindfulness tradition. Uh, you can so that plugs in. Uh, the, that's the the, the 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 work that Mark is doing. I want to all I want to talk to you about this. Mark is you know. Uh, you know, I, I've done a lot about the problem of the what I call the ontonormativity of higher states of consciousness, and maybe we can talk about that. You know, Greg Enriquez and Christopher Master Pietro and I did a whole thing on the cognitive science of the self, and so yeah. we can bring that into discussion. But maybe yeah. let's try to build a few a few quick bridges, and then we can get yeah. into this really. Oh, it's so exciting! That's really juicy. I love yeah. the work you're doing. Great. So, I'll, I'm going to give sort of a, a very rough you know, and we have to be sort of quick and gisty about how I see my work and your work, and, and, you know, and, and Brett brought us together and you brought, and you reached out to me and it, 
right? How I see it going together and maybe a bit of how this works and, and then how that we could potentially take that into uh, this topic. You can then, Sounds of course, great. you know, criticize or compliment. I mean, I don't mean give me compliments. I mean, add to compliment, compliment <laughs> yeah. that framework. Um, yeah. And then, you know, once we both agree that we have sort of a, a rich enough uh, framework on the table, we can go into this discussion of, first of all, let's go into that, that specific recent work. What's the core argument? How does yeah. it, and then I can dialogue with you about some of the other concerns I have around wisdom, self-transcendence, the yeah. onto, the, you know, what's the, weird, you know, the very weird epistemological state of these higher states of consciousness. Why are they taken to legitimate certain claims, et cetera? Mm. So that's, that's what I would like to explore. Love this. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. So the, the basic idea, um, oh, and I, just one quick thing uh, for those of you mm. who might be a little bit about a couple of the terms Mark was using. Mark's going to make clear what he means by active inference. And mm -hmm. for those of you thinking we're retreating into a Cartesian kind of model, that's not how Mark uses that term at all. So he's going to be very clear about that and why he has a very 4E cog side take on that. Mm -hmm. So that's going to come up in a, in a very, just, to, just a little bit of, uh, of clarification around that. Mark is bound to the tradition of predictive processing where that term emerged. Um, so uh, predictive processing is the idea um, that what organisms are ultimately doing is trying to reduce the degree to which they're surprised within their sensory motor interaction with the world. And the, the sort of really fundamental insight, and it, it sort of overlaps with some insights that were being developed in machine learning by people like Hinton, is the brain basically is trying to predict itself in order to predict the world. Trying to predict the world directly turns out to be like a really hairy problem. Um, and how, how can you even tell if you're getting the appropriate feedback? But what the brain tries to do is predict itself. Uh, and we can talk, it's schematic. So don't think this is necessarily anatomic. You can talk about higher levels, trying to predict the behavior of lower levels. And, and, and this is done in a recursive relationship between the levels and it's dynamically self-organizing. So the higher levels try to predict what the lower levels are doing. These are the levels of the brain and the, and the body and the nervous system that are causally interacting with the world. And they're getting into states that are due both to their internal uh, properties and to the causal properties of the world. The higher levels of the brain are trying to predict the, and find patterns in the lower levels. And when they get it wrong, error moves up, if you'll allow me that spatial language, um, and to correct. And then the higher levels, the top down levels, modify their predictions. And what you're getting, and we have to be very careful about how we use this word, is you're getting a model. And here's the idea. And we sort of knew that this had to be the case way back when. When this modeling, when this dynamically self-organizing recursive modeling of the proximal, the proximal events, at the, at, the, at the level of the brain that are in contact with the world get very good, what actually happens is the brain gets the ability to predict through the proximal events, distal events and distal patterns in the world. Now, I'm trying to summarize a lot of information yeah. without, using very, without using very much jargon. And yeah, so, yeah. And, and then this, and this is where Mark, so there's, right, and very broadly, people have the idea, although there's controversy around this, that something like Bayesian probability updating is going on, other people. So, you know, uh, we won't get in, we might not need to get into the specific as that. But one of the things that Mark emphasizes um, is that if you'll allow me to do this sort of diagrammatically, this, this fundamental dynamic self-organization and this causal coupling with the world Right, they're both dynamically self organized Those two couplings are coupled together in a dynamical fashion. So don't think of the prediction as an event happening here and then the organism acts and then it, right? So it's not that old model. It's not the old, right, you know, input, calculate, output. It's not that at all. It's that the brain is constantly basically doing something much more like man sculpting its response uh, space and then that is opening up or closing off ongoing dynamically created affordances between the organism and the environment within its ongoing sensory motor behavior. 
So how's that yeah. going so Yeah, far? that's great. That's great. You know, I like the idea of attunement, you know, really yeah. what's happening yeah. here. You yeah. can think about it, you know, we can talk about it in the language of building a model. And, yeah. um, you know, there's, um, there's, a, there's a gradation of camps here. Some say, no, it really is a sort of internal model. Yeah. Some say, no, like language of models isn't useful at all. And then yes. you, have, you have people along the middle. Andy Clark sometimes settles right around the middle. He's definitely left leaning if you think of left as non non representational and non model yeah. based. Yeah. But he is happy to say, like with imagination or with um, you know future planning in a in a highly imaginative way, it does look like we have something like model building active, mm -hmm. you know, acting. And um, I remember during my PhD defense, Sean Gallagher asked me like, where do I where do I sit on that right right on right that spectrum. And I said, I said, well, I said, well, I'm somewhere between Edinburgh, which was Andy's location, and Amsterdam, which is um, Eric Reitfeld and and Julian Kiverstein, who are right. more very, radically very, yeah, more yeah, radically yeah. an activist about these things. And he says, oh, so you're you're up floating in the North Sea. And I said, yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in the North Sea. Yeah. So I like I like attunement. Yeah. So you can think about air minimization or free energy minimization in terms of attunement between a whole embodied. Uh, dynamic organism and its environmental niche. And then what active inference or predictive processing ends up giving us is a suite of tools to talk about. Well, how do um, self-organizing dynamical systems fit and attune to a constantly changing and noisy environment? And the way they do that, it seems, potentially is they reduce, they reduce the difference, the harmful differences between how that model is set up and how the niche is unfolding. Um, right. So you don't have to buy into any sort of strong internal modeling here, not necessarily. Um, right. And I also like that, you know, the model isn't just in the brain, but rather the brain and nervous system. And in fact, the whole body can be thought of as a model just at different yeah. time scales, right? I mean, the reason why we're upright is because we were managing free energy over a certain period of time. And the result was uprightness did it for us. If you look, if you look long enough scales. So, so just, that was great, Mark. Uh, just to be clear, when Mark is invoking free energy, he's not talking about something, at least not directly from physics. He's talking about a technical term of basically right. about of something like uh, error, he, error reduction. We could just say we could just say prediction error. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So uh, I, I remember uh, I, I, I might not be quoting this verbatim, but uh, when I was doing the course uh, and then with the, the series with Greg and uh, Chris about Carl Friston saying, you know, we don't have a, a, a a model of the self that we, we are, are yeah, yeah we are a model where right? like yeah. the whole of us is exactly. doing this ongoing dynamical attunement uh yeah. to the world so yeah. that i mean that's already the heideggerian language and that's already sure language. Is. um and so one of the things that comes up um is you know and, and this, this and this is not anything you know oh right everybody acknowledges this you can't do a straight sort of base, and we've known this since Gilbert Harmon's change in view book, right? You can't do, you know, a, an actual algorithmic Bayesian calculation you know, of probabilities. You're gonna, it's, that's combinatorial explosive, it's intractable. And then, so what, one of the main moves, um, and I think this is important, although I, I do, I will, I will say, I don't think I don't think many people give enough theoretical credit to the dynamical self-organization and the recursivity within the theoretical explanatory structure. That's yeah. um, usually just sort of, well, that's the approximation machine. And I think that is, that, 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 that's not a good theoretical move. I think we should say, no, no, doing that is actually the hard work that the brain is, is trying to solve in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely hear that. You know, it's funny that we balk at that you know, critics, critics of the framework uh, sort of balk at that move, but it's pervasive. It seems to me that's pervasive in all sorts of neighboring fields. I mean, Peter yeah. Sterling's work on life is about optimization. Um, and that seems, that seems completely credible to me that life is about optimizing. Yes. You know, all of life was trying to solve optimization problems. And each step that we see along the way in evolution exactly. are all leaps in optimization. And so all you're saying is, Optimal Bayesian updating is just saying that the system is is optimally updating its relationship with its niche and it's learning optimally. Um, of course, yeah. that can go funny in all sorts of ways. You know, the last five or six years, we've been doing a lot of work on psychopathology. That's actually what um, started our thinking about well-being and happiness. In fact, is that we wrote papers on 
depression, anxiety, OCD, depersonalization, mood disorders. And um, so there's lots of ways that an optimizing, my point is there's lots of ways that an optimizing system can go suboptimally. So that's one thing to be careful of here, just because a system is an optimizing, uh, you know, yeah. optim yep. an optimal directive system doesn't mean it can stay, it can be optimal in a certain way where it creates suboptimal outcomes. And that's what we were interested in a lot. And of course that gives some clues for what might be going right also. So that connects to uh, just another point of connection for hmm. some viewers, uh, sort of a central argument I make about meaning and wisdom is the very dynamical self-organizing processes that make us adaptive also make us percept perpetually vulnerable to self-deceptive self behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah, and that is and, and that is everywhere. I mean this uh, uh, yeah. one of the one of the and it's almost a feature. It's not even a bug really. It's like a yeah, feature yeah. of the system that there are self-fulfilling prophecies right at the core of this thing because the thing you expect to be the case is also the thing you go out to try to confirm. Right. And the fact right. is yeah. in a in a highly complex world you're likely to be able to find the confirmation information that you're looking for. And actually right. we're getting very close to discussions about normativity and wisdom here, because then the question is, if that's how the optimizing system works, then um, what can we do to make sure that it's optimizing well rather than poorly? Cause I mean, right. filter bubbles and echo chambers online are great examples of this. You know, yep. you get installed a high level belief. Yep. Yep. So uh, the world is flat. And uh, then of course that's not a very good belief because there's tons of counter evidence. So now yep. you're getting all sorts of error in your system and an optimizing, an optimizing predictive agent should, in the face of good counter evidence, should adjust its, should adjust its weighting on these sorts of beliefs. So they should update optimally over time, but there's all sorts of ways that that could not happen. Yep. For instance, if you're in a social circle where everybody believes that, then somehow that belief can get pinned. It can get pinned based on what other people believe and now there's a bunch of error in the system and now the system basically has to figure out how to manage that error and it can do one of two things it can update its model or it can change the world and if it's pinned strongly enough then what it'll do is it'll try to update the world so that it can relieve that error which means spending more time on websites where the flat yeah. earthers hang out yeah and getting rid of all of your friends who are not flat earthers. I mean, that's one way you can optimize. You're optimizing yeah. relative to a belief set. The belief set is the world is flat and now you're optimizing relative to that belief set. So you're right. optimally, you're optimally moving in a bad direction. You're fulfilling a weird, a weird belief, self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and you're doing that optimally. So the system is working just fine. Um, we made the same sort of move in a paper that we wrote on addiction. And um, the reason why I mentioned that is because it's, I think it's provocative. I think it's meaningful and I think it's important, but it is also provocative to see that things that we think of as disease, actually the system is still optimizing in exactly the way it should yeah. be optimizing. Yeah. So it yeah. does push back a little bit about what do we mean by disease? Because actually the brain is still functioning just the way you would expect the brain to function. It's optimizing beautifully. It's just optimizing over bad inputs. Yeah. So there are bad, there's a bad belief structure and it's optimizing relative to that. Um, and then you're getting pathological outcomes by the optimizing machinery working over bad information. And in addiction, the bad information, of course, is things like opioids. They adjust the predictive system actively as if things are going better than you expected yeah. in the environment when, in fact, they're going worse. But, you know, maybe that's for another conversation. Yeah. Well, no, it's good. I, well, I want to go back to another point, but uh, well, th th this will help me segue. I mean, that connects up with, you know, uh, Mark Lewis's work. Under, exactly. Uh, that's very, who we, that's. Yeah, 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 good. Yeah, exactly. And people are aware of that. And, yeah. and that brings in the normativity issue because, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that I, I, when I was having lunch with Mark and he was doing his reciprocal narrowing model, I then said, well, you know, but then the opposite has to be possible, the reciprocal opening, and that ties into the platonic. So that may give us some ways of talking about normativity and wisdom. And that right there is the, that's the keystone. I mean, that's exactly the same. That's where, I mean, one of our very first sort of exciting conversations in the last year yeah. was exactly this point, because yeah. we were working on, the, we had the same idea up and running in slightly different camps, but the exact same idea, which was there are ways in which this optimizing system can tend towards a greater and greater narrowing and a greater yeah. and greater fragility yeah. Um, and then there, and if that's the case, and we see that in, we yeah. see that in depression and addiction, well, we see it in lots of the psychopathology families. So then the question was, if a continual narrowing 
is a problem that creates fragility and um, you know reduces our anti-fragility, then what about the other way? Like yeah, what would exactly. it be for an optimizing yeah. system to continually open? And yeah. that's exactly what we think well-being also is from this model. And that really meets up with your work too. Yeah, thank you for saying that. So, yeah. so to get back to this and, and yeah. uh, to, to introduce a term that's in Mark's work, it's in my work, it's a big term in, um, in embodied cognition, uh, which is salience. And one of the one of the things that people often say is, you know, well, you don't you don't do the Bayesian modeling or the predictive modeling on everything. There's a selection process, which of course that's you know we're in the finitary predicament. We have finite time, finite processing time, finite resources, processing resources, etc. So there's a selection process, and it has something to do with salience, and, and that has important cognitive and motivational factors. And then this, you know, this overlaps with attention. I, I'm getting to something very quickly. And so there needs to be, you know, there needs to be a selection process. It involves attention and, so, and selection. And then you, well, Brett approached me about this and you and I were already starting to talk about this. There's a move at sort of the cutting edge of predictive processing, or at least it's relatively cutting edge, uh, right? Which is, you know, the idea of precision weighting, the, the idea that there's, so there's, in addition to reducing error, the system has a higher order ability to assign importance to certain kinds of patterns over other, because there's lots of error that doesn't really matter uh, in, in fundamental. It's not newsworthy, yeah. non-newsworthy error. Yeah, right. And so, and, and, and you know, and, and then, you, you know, Brett and I were working our way through it, and then you sort of, you were always one step ahead, but it was like, well, then, you know, we... They taught, they did reliability, and then there was problems with that. And then, you know, there's salience, and then there was the invocation of task relevance, right? Which is also, you know, and for me initially it was like, oh, that just sounds like the homunculus of relevance realization. But what 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 I see us doing is the idea of no, no, no. This process of sort of setting the criterion, which is, you know, from signal detection theory, uh, 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 of where the processing resources are, 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 are should give their uh, effort, which is what attention is, you know, there's a lot of growing consensus that attention is some kind of prioritization on signal, right? So there's something, there has to be some way in which that prioritization is being regulated. And what I see us doing is saying, well, you can either think that some sort of top-down calculation, or you can think that it's a dynamically self-organizing, you know, constantly evolving way of trying to set the precision weighting. And that's precisely where, you know, you and I and Brett are bringing the relevance realization machinery and the predictive processing uh, machinery together. Yeah. And then the, 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 the piece that you emphasize is that dynamical self-organizing uh, process of precision weighting should be properly understood as affective, affective in nature, having to do with affect. And that lines up with what I've always said that relevance realization is not cold calculation. It is this ongoing process by which the organism is spending its very, very precious bioeconomic resources. We talk about paying attention, I think very, very well. Paying. That's yeah, nice. attention, right? And then so that, and this is the Heideggerian thing, deep within cognition is caring. And then that's gonna to start to get us into these ideas of meaning. Um, so first of all, how do you, how do you, is, is that a yeah. fair take on how our work yeah. is all coming together? Yeah, so just a couple of things there. So you're right, um, precision weighting. So that's the system's um, self expectations about its own abilities exactly. and, uh, and the yeah. value of the different streams of information it has coming in. So it's a second order form of information. Right. And um, it's really the hero. It's the hero of the whole whole story in a way, because everything everything evolves forward based on what gets precision. So if errors aren't meaningful, then they don't go forward in the system. Right. Um, what has been the case over the last couple of years is precision is such a hero of the story, it's difficult to know how any one mechanism could do that. And you can sort of yeah. make the mistake to think, well, it's just kind of one thing. And actually, we wrote a paper not too long ago about, um, about precision not really being one thing at all. We think that one of the reasons why it looks like a little bit 
like a magic modulator we say in our paper yeah, is yeah. because of this expectation that there's one thing rather than many things. Right, um, right. But in fact, there isn't just there isn't just one thing. Precision weighting is actually uh, a whole family of different things that are happening in different parts of the system. Um, and so the cutting edge of that work today is trying to figure out, well, what are all of the mechanisms that are doing this work of precision weighting? And one of those, uh, one of the primary ones uh, that we're interested in is the role that affectivity plays in setting precision weighting. So, um, and we could maybe talk a little bit more about that if it's interesting. Well, it is, um, and that's exactly what I was trying to get at, at the idea that this isn't being set like sort of a top-down calculation. It's this, you know, hierarch hierarchical or, or, or some kind of uh, recursive dynamical system that is doing uh, the precision weighting process. And, uh, you know, I, I'm interested in the degree, I mean, and we've, we've explored this in the paper we're doing with Brett on schizotypy and autism, the degree to which kind of opponent processes uh, are at work in terms of this kind of fundamental bioeconomics of a, of, a, of an autopoetic system that, you know, the, what is the system doing? How is it managing? it? So, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. And so this isn't pushback, but it's like, it's like, is the activity, I mean, is affectivity just another component or is it right? Something Right, it might be one component among many factors, but it sounds to me like, hmm, I don't see it as just a part uh, in, in, no. in this model, right? No, right, right. right? It, it's well, it, 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 because it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous bridge between caring and you know and, and predicting between taking care of oneself. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. caring about some information rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? I, yeah. I think I think the way I think the way to pitch it is um, it is just it is one of the it is one of the ways in which our system has evolved to set precision. Right. It just turns out to be a bloody important one. You yes. know, and especially okay. for the and especially for the kinds of things that we're interested in discussing. Because yes. what you basically get is that um, changes in how well you're managing volatility over time that's really what ends up being this yep. um this part of the precision estimator right. um it uh it changes our affectivity so this is closely related with valence so feeling attracted towards or repelled yeah. away yeah, yeah yeah they arise relative to how well we're reducing so maybe i can just say a little bit more detail here please, so please Right. Please. So affectivity, we think at least part of affectivity. Now, again, this isn't exhaustive because interception yeah. interception is a layered, complicated yeah, thing. Yeah. Right. right. Um, one element of affectivity um, that's related to valence, so being attracted towards or repelled away, being pulled into the world or pushed away, having the world afford for yeah. action or or affording for you to move away, um, yeah. that's going to be closely linked to how efficiently we're managing error over time. So right. it specifically has to do with how well or poorly we're reducing prediction error relative to expectations. So an easier way of saying that is when we do better than expected at reducing errors. So let's say we expect, um, uh, we expect uh, that it's gonna take me uh, a two mile walk to get to my favorite cafe. And then I walk down tomorrow and lo and behold, they've opened another chain like, <laughs> literally right beside my office. The good feeling that I suddenly have is my system registering a far better than expected reduction of prediction right. error. And so that's why it feels good. And it's why um, I learn very, very quickly that I never really have to go two miles anymore. I can just go uh, down to my cafe. Okay, so it no, feels good, good when we, yeah. so it feels good when we do better than expected at reducing error and it feels bad when we do worse than expected at uh, reducing prediction error. And that information turns out to be central to attuning precision because if a certain action policy, a certain behavior does much better than expected at reducing prediction you raise error, it, you raise it, yeah. then you should think I should feel more confident I should feel more confident about that action policy. But if it does worse than expected, then you should lose your confidence in that kind of policy. Um, so when everything is working right, that better than and worse than, good feelings and bad feelings, should keep us tuned to right. what matters to us in the world and keep us tuned in particular to improving. And maybe we can come back to that. But um, So that's sort of the idea. And oh, one, one last thing, if that's right then, then everything that, one of the reasons why I think you and I 
are both really interested in this, why we think that, well, no, this really has to be a central feature in precision. I'm not sure if it is or not, but it is if we're talking about meaning or yep. salience or yep. importance or, yep. or affordances. I mean, right here is where like the team in Amsterdam, Eric Reitfeld and Julian Kiverstein, you yep. know, they're really taking an inactive approach to this. Yep. And thinking about this in terms of Gibsonian affordances and Gibsonian right. affordance psychology. Um, and that's where those meet, of course, because um, affectivity is here. What draws you? It draws you into the world to find better than expected opportunities for reducing error. Yeah, I don't know if they, that was too complicated, but. No, no, I think that's good. Okay. Good. And they, I mean, and they, they, have, they have sort of these levels, um, which correspond somewhat to the, well, I think quite a bit to the participatory knowing and the perspectival knowing. You got the levels, uh, right? That are sort of creating the uh, the affordance landscape, as they say. It. But then there's a there's a, you know there's a higher level of salience that is activating or sele selecting the particular affordances that are going to be made active within this particular situation. So that's right. There's, there's something that is selecting the affordances into the situation at hand, and I think that maps on to the the first is the participatory knowing, and the second is the perspectival knowing, uh, and, 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 and I think that's also very exciting for me. But what I wanted yeah. to ask you is, mm, and I, I, want, I want to note something uh, because I mean, and, and this is why the talk of affordance is appropriate because affordance is not in the organism, not in the environment but between them, because you can think of, well, I'll just use this, the, 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 the attunement model or whatever it is, right? The, right? It, it's just because you went down the hill, but right, that only, that's always relative to the dynamics of the environment. If Mark is in a particularly unstable environment, he's not going to he's not going to be as rapidly changing or, or, or you know he might he might be he, he might want, not want to be that confident because if they're tearing down buildings every day, there's a good chance that that building not might not be there tomorrow. That's right. right? Exactly. So right so this thing is constantly being decided and sorry for the anthropomorphic language because it's misplaced, but it's constantly being decided it's being co-determined by the environment, the dynamics of the environment and the dynamics of the embodied brain. And so that's, so it's very much the generation, right, of affordances that are happening there, which is again why I see some deep connections uh, to what, you know, the ontology of relevance realization, but I've been trying to argue that relevance is ultimately this kind of transjective thing. Yes, yeah, love that. Uh, John, can I just, yes. can we just, can we slice the video there? I'm just going to deal with getting the door closed and some of the distractions gone from the background, if that's okay. Uh, so I can pause here. It so th this idea of this dynamic evolving generation of affordance and then higher order selecting of the affordances into the situational awareness and how that's tapping into sort of different levels of the self. I mean, this is all... Uh, so relevant to topics of identity and meaning, not, not semantic meaning per se, but that meaning in that sense of that meaningful, relevant, salient, important, cared for and careful connectedness uh, to, uh, to reality. And, and this nice. is, yeah. Yeah, it's nice that you, it's, and actually we're sort of going right back to the initial topic that you thought was interesting. So. Right. We think that this special role that affectivity is playing in tuning the system to what matters, being yeah. based on how efficient you're doing at yeah. attuning to your niche, and that makes perfect sense, I think, from the relevance realization um, yeah. literature, yeah. Yeah. that that feeling is an important part of what it feels like to be a person. Yes. Again, yeah. again, at person. The at least the self. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So personhood and selfhood are complicated complicated um, things. And uh, of course, the phenomenology of being a person is a complicated thing. Yeah. But this is, again, playing a star role. Is it a, a, an important part of what it feels like to be us is this constant affective tuning yeah. relative to how well or poorly you're optimizing given your niche. And um, so here, just if it's interesting, can I link back to the, to the deep No, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted, to go back, right. I, I, I wanted to go back to the, the topic because I think we've got the framework. That's what I right. wanted to lead to. I right. wanted to go back right. to the topic of, right. you, know, uh, you know, superlative self-loss versus privative self-loss, if I could put yeah. it that way. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so here's the interesting thing that we found. Um, depersonalization uh, today, um, um, a popular hypothesis is evolving in that community of researchers, which is depersonalization is importantly linked to some affective dampening. So yeah. we see that the we see that the anterior insular cortex isn't communicating as well with the rest of the brain in people who have disassociative disorders. And right. you can mark you can mark the transition out of disassociative disorders back to ordinary phenomenological functioning when the AIC starts again propagating its signal throughout right. the brain. Okay. So interestingly, we see a reduction in affective processing and we see a subsequent loss of selfhood. And right. we think that the affective tuning is constantly being pushed and pulled relative to what you care about in the world, which is essentially what those error dynamics do. We call them error dynamics. Yep, yep. Do. Um, that gives you a real sense of being a person and they can go quiet. Why do they go quiet? In depersonalization, um, it's like a kind of, um, I like the metaphor of um, the emotional airbag. You've hit some trauma. Right. So that means there's unmanageable error, unmanageable volatility in We're your getting world. Getting overwhelmed. Right. Okay. And you can't update your model fast enough and you can't change the world well enough to, to stop that volatility. So torture is a good example of where right. that happened. Right. Lots of things yeah. happen like it, but torture is a good one, right? You have persistent error in the body. You can't update relative to your expected homeostatic states. Yeah. Not very yeah. well anyway, yeah. like yeah. years of practice you can. So you can have Buddhist monks who sit through their death. I mean, that's possible, yeah. but it's, it's not it's a lot probable. Of work. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, a lot yeah, of work, yeah. right? So if you have persistent error over a long enough period of time, then you're getting the negative affective signal telling you this isn't working. Yeah. Like whatever's going on, it's not good. Yeah. yeah? And that's, the suff that's actually the suffering on top of the pain that you're feeling. Right. Normally what would happen is when that negative affect turns on, it should get the system to task switch somewhere else. Right. So for instance, if you're learning a new instrument and you're doing worse than expected at playing a song, and you kind of feel bad about it. What that'll tend to do is you'll put the instrument down and you'll just move into another niche where you have a better predictive grip and that'll yeah. allow you to get back up to a good slope of error reduction. Okay. So you leave that and you go and do something else and then you come back to it, or maybe you go back to your chords or maybe you pick an easier song. So I hope you see how like the negative yeah. affect is meant to get the system to optimally adapt or adjust if yeah. it can't update fast enough. But if you can't do that, if you can't do that, then what ends up happening is the higher level and, it, you know, higher, higher yeah, level, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but the higher level that's supposed to be trying to task switch you away isn't able to task switch for whatever reason. Yep. So yes. what happens is, is you lose confidence there. You start losing confidence there. So that starts being error filled as well. Cause you thought ordinarily you can task switch away from pain. You can't hear, which means error starts cascading up again. Mm -hmm. Now there's a higher level, which should have a more global task switching ability. Now it starts getting propagated with errors. It tries to task switch away. You can't task switch away and oh. it goes up again. So you have a critical failure basically up the system. And the, the last aspect, the last part of the system that then the sort of fail safe is, well, just stop, stop yeah. having any confidence that what you do will make any difference in the world. Yeah. So this is learned helplessness that comes out of yes, long term yes. suffering. Yeah. And the result of that is you stop having the same affective responses because you no longer have expectations for how error should be resolved. So you have no tuning relative yeah. to how error should be resolved. The problem is you throw the baby out with the bathwater. So suffering gets managed well, but now you lose that tuning system that's meant to keep you in touch with yep. your various cares and concerns. So suddenly you have the strange phenomenology that the world is flat. Nothing calls to me. I don't feel like anything matters. I don't know who I am anymore. Well, because yep. partially yep. of what it is to feel like you is that you feel involved in your various cares and concerns. And that can be that can sort of be washed away in this way. That's what we, that's what we pitched as the that's, primary that's mechanism really, of depersonalization. I mean, and that, that's so much uh, a reciprocal narrowing and the loss of a lot of the connectedness, the meaning in life, relevance, realization machine, like your salience landscaping has just been 
just been, you know, you know, remember the Gestalt tradition, the, the, the Gonsfeld, where there's no salience difference. It's that's right. A, Right, so I, I'm I'm right. understanding you well then. Right. So so then so, so then if aerodynamics if aerodynamics and affectivity are doing that, if that's part of their role, yeah. Then we then then that's a really it, it's an interesting place to start thinking about all of those exactly those sorts of cases because now we have a computational theory that we can model and then we can test as a model. In fact. So this, I mean, and so I have a suspicion that there's going to be a mm -hmm. way of of distinguishing this privative loss of self, and, and this is a very Heideggerian argument, to, to lose the self is to learn, is to lose how to care about the world, uh, because those are bound together just in separate Right, because right? Right, this is care. It's essentially yeah. care yeah. is what we're talking about. Right, right, uh, very much. And, and, I mean, and I mean, it's interesting, because normally the autopoetic taking care of oneself is, is functionally bound up with, you know, caring about some information rather than the other. But if you push the dynamics too far, the system's taking care of itself can cause it to lose the ability to care about some information rather than the other. And that's a very, very interesting way of thinking about this. So normally they're coupled and they're mutually affording, but if you put them in the, the right, I don't mean the morally right, but if you put them in the right for the hypothesis context, you can actually get them to come apart and do a kind of oppositional processing rather than right that's really interesting so Very. so and this is my suspicion and now that's the privative and is there some sort of reciprocal opening uh version of the superlative <laughs> loss of self right, 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 <laughs> right okay so now what happens in contemplative training right because okay, now is that so now we've got it we've got at least a, an opening story which yeah. is me personalization is an affective airbag Basically, what's happened is the system is is hit a certain kind of volatility that it can't manage. Great metaphor, by getting, the way. I like the metaphor; just excellent. And now it's getting all of this pervasive and difficult to manage air, which is negatively, affectively charged. Right. And you're trying to get away, and you can't get away. So the last thing it does is, well, you lose confidence on your ability to do anything, which essentially drops affect out of the system. That's the airbag coming up, right? That's the, right. Right. Exactly. right. But what you lose at the same time is. And th there's why you can tell how important aerodynamics and affectivity setting precision is. So yeah. back to just that point, because without it, you think the world doesn't make any sense and you've lost who you are. So that's how yeah. central it is. Whatever yeah. Yeah. that yeah. part that's setting yeah. precision is yes. who you are yes. and central to the meaning in the world. Yeah. Okay. Now, very interestingly, the Buddhist tradition also talks about valence and trains over valence. It's called Vedana in the yeah. Pali, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the four foundations of mindfulness. And the Buddha talks a lot about reflecting and being mindful on Vedana, on changes yeah. in valence, on yeah. when things feel better or feel worse than expected yeah. relative yeah. to expectations, yeah. 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 yeah? Okay, so we also focus there and we do no self work there. So one of the trainings is you're meant to look at those things and you're meant to see, well, that doesn't make up, that doesn't make up the entirety of the system. And you might think that you're meant to get rid of valence, but actually, if you look closely at the suttas, there's no such thing as that. The I, Buddha agree. Never says, I agree. Buddha I agree. never says get rid of feeling good or feeling bad. The Buddha talks about your attachment or craving relative to your good or bad feeling. So there's a lovely sutta. I, yeah. I should have brought it today, actually. But yeah. there's a love, uh, and I'll just I'll just um, summarize. But he says uh, the the noble, well trained disciple. That's an arhant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so the noble, cool. well trained disciple. When something good happens to them, they feel good. Yep. And when that good thing is taken from them, they feel bad. So if anybody was unclear that our hearts yep. have good and bad valence relative excellent, to expectation, excellent, excellent. there it is. But he goes on to say, but when a bad thing happens, a worse than expected aerodynamic yep. happens, okay, yep. they don't gnash their teeth and, and mourn for ages. They don't, get, they don't get severely punished by that thing. And when a better than expected thing happens, when a good Vedana happens, they don't suddenly crave more of that thing. So yeah. Yeah. the point is, these things are still active. They're still functioning well in the Arhat, okay? Um, but they're no longer engendering, they're no longer engendering pathological or unskillful behaviors from those. Okay, so if they're functioning fine, then right away we know it's not identical with yeah. Yeah. depersonalization. Yeah. And when you put monks in an MRI, 
what do we see in the, in the anterior insular cortex? We see exactly the opposite computational profile that we see in depersonalization. 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 We see yeah. a muting and, a, and a, a shortening and a restriction of its global communicativity. In Buddhist monks, of course, you see the anterior insular cortex is supercharged. It's yeah. huge yeah. because they've done all this self interceptive work. So it's huge. And it's got its connections all through the brain. So right, it's, it's right. exactly the opposite brain system yeah. if you're looking in particular at affectivity. So affectivity, so but here's the trick. Oh, you wanted to say something. Do you want to jump in there just before I before well, I finish? No, I just want I just wanted to say that uh you know part of part of what what I, 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 is the uh you know the 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 the, the, uh, the similar criticisms I've heard uh, you know, in so one of the, the sutra where the, the Buddha doesn't, you know, doesn't, people shouldn't be pursuing a kind of indolence in their meditative, right? That it, it's not designed to make the, and, you know, the middle path was also between self-indulgence and, you know, and, and self, self-negation and, right? Right. Because both right. of those bind you into a framework of the self, right? right. That, and that's what the, so the Buddha isn't, the Buddha isn't sort of anti- Right, he's trying to break the framework. Uh, an analogy uh, to some of the, uh, the listeners is in a similar way that I'm trying. I'm neither. I describe myself neither as a theist or an atheist, and this is a Buddhist move. I'm trying. I'm a non-theist, although the atheists are now trying to adopt that term, which is unfair. Yeah. Right. I'm a non-theist, and that I'm trying to break the framework of presuppositions that yeah. is shared by the theist and the atheist. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so, this is what I mean about. How I, it, it, this is why I mean about how I could see it connected to a profound kind of reciprocal opening, because there's the sense in which that framework of the self is still keeping right the, the, the attunement machinery locked into a presuppositional framework. And if you open up, if you get outside of that framework, you're affording reciprocal opening. And I'm making you happy, so I must be, I must. No, it's right good. Time. It's so good. <laughs> I love this. All this language of breaking and opening and transcending is yeah. exactly what we think happens. So the move we make is what happens when you, so there is definitely a change yeah. relative yeah. to these aerodynamics in the Buddhist contemplative path, yeah. Yeah. because you're meant to be increasingly and subtly mindful, powerfully mindful of those things. So something is happening relative to Vedna to valence. That's an important yeah. feature. So what is yeah. happening? Good, well, good. the thing that we know for sure is it's not going quiet. You're yeah. not disrupting it. You're not degrading it. And this is good for anybody who's listening to this today, because also, you know, I'm a longtime meditator and now a longtime meditation teacher. Uh, if you are trying to stop feeling pain or pleasure, you're going potentially the wrong way. And that's because how you, can, up. You, Go ahead. you can mute that. You can mute that. Yes. Atten attention training is a powerful bypassing. Thing. That's spiritual bypassing. And now we have a computational reason why it's so dangerous because right. your, your metacognitive control over your own precision profile, which is just to say your own control over your own attention is yeah. a powerful thing. Like we've said, it's the hero of this whole self-organizing story. You can do lots of weird stuff to yourself using that power. Yes. And if, yeah. you, if you try to reduce your pleasure and pain rather than your craving attachment and aversion to pleasure yeah. and pain, you can do exactly what we suspect is happening in depersonalization. You can mute the system that ordinarily makes you feel like a person in the world with meaningful yeah. endeavors. And that's not yeah. the right, that's not the right uh, target for the development. So what is the right target? Well, you're meant to be mindful. You're meant to be mindful of the good feelings and the bad feelings. Well, why is that valuable? Well, here's the trick. Okay. This is awesome. Okay. So, uh, this builds on the work of uh, Lars Sandved Smith, who is a great meditation practitioner and teacher and um, active inference student. He's working with um, Carl Friston at UCL. And he and I are doing lots of projects together. We actually teach meditation together as well using these frameworks, which is pretty cool. Um, he has shown computationally uh, that what, ha what happens when you set precision on precision. Ah, okay. ah. Now, you begin, now you begin to attend to how attention is being regulated right, 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 by right, right, affectivity. Right, 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 right. right, right and right. an amazing thing happens. You, and you don't break it. You don't disrupt it. You model it. You watch it until you understand it. You watch it begin. You watch it live. You watch it end. Yeah. You watch it grow. And then you watch what feelings and thought patterns grow from it. And then they pass. Basically, what you're doing is you're rendering 
that precision engineer opaque rather than transparent. So right. rather than the precision, shift. yes, yes. Rather than precision driving the system automatically, that's right. what happens by evolution, right? Yep. So we've had we've had valence driving precision since we were worms, probably yeah, like yeah, for yeah. a really long so, time. Okay? It goes back to the beginnings of operant conditioning, right? Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. And if you think of like uh, Antonio Damasio, that's yeah. right at the beginning of consciousness was, yeah, yeah, yeah. was affectivity driving precision dynamics. Okay. Yeah. So if we don't look at that closely enough, it has in it all of our evolutionary package. And some yeah. of that stuff is good. And yeah. some of it is garbage, you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the gift of metacognition is that we can go back and start rescripting some of these things if we're careful exactly. and, we're, exactly. and we're persistent. Okay. So as long as it's transparent, we don't know exactly how precision is being adjusted. So yes. the way that that's experienced by us is, oh, that is a good thing or that yeah. is a bad thing. So somebody hurts you and you say, that's a bad person. Right. I can just, because you're, you're transparently yeah. seeing the world yeah. through the precision adjustment of doing worse than expected. See, I don't like them. I yeah, don't yeah, like yeah. that part of the world. So this is what it is to live in ignorance, so right? The, the, that, that transparency is a, uh, you know, it, it, it is a profound kind of projection. And you can see this exactly. both in the Buddhist traditions and the Stoic traditions, of course. right? Yeah, of keep course. going, keep going, keep exactly. going. Okay, so now with metacognition, with the great gift of metacognition, we have for the first time an ability to take precision and start setting it on the precision estimator itself. And what happens yeah. gradually is you make the precision engineer into an object of right. prediction, yep. which, which actually opens up a new level of optimization because yes. you're able to yes. predictions. Optimization. Yes, yes. You're able yes. to make predictions now about how precision is being set over your predictions. Okay, so we call this, so this is a deep parametric model is what's being developed now where you can see iterant layers of the same thing happening. So basically awareness is um, setting precision on precision as an object on the object. And oh the incredible gosh. thing happens. As soon as that happens, you have literally, so just notice you're not messing around with pleasure or pain. Right. Pleasure right. or pain exists just as they are. And in fact, Here's another big difference between depersonalization and awakening, at least in the Buddhist tradition. You need to have valence turned on in order to model it, in order yes. to be free of it. Yes. You yeah. can't put precision up front and gain this. What essentially happens when you put precision up front is you gain all of this control. So basically the way that that would feel is you, this becomes like signals. Okay, a good way to say it is, as soon as this is modeled, then Valence becomes information for the system rather than being identical, rather than being identified as the system itself. So now you can say, yeah, that felt good. So that's information for me to make a decision or that yeah. felt bad. So that's information for me to make some decision about how it should go. It's no longer driving the system. It's now being used by the system. But just notice in depersonalization, yeah. if that information goes away, then there's nothing to model in the, Sati, in the Satipatthana Sutta, there's nothing to be mindful of because it's missing. If you can't be mindful of it, you can't model it. If you can't model it, you can't transcend it. If you don't transcend it, you don't get any of the awakening benefits, which is this gain in control, gain in flexibility, gain in, uh, in metastability. Yeah. So what you're, what, I mean, and this is something I've been going, uh, like I've been trying to emphasize too, that, you know, that I, I don't like the pain model of dukkha that has right. become prevalent in the West. And, and, and I, I say, go back to the original meaning of suffering as loss of agency yeah. rather than pain. And, and again, if, so Velman's idea that like, you know, he talks about the reflectiveness gap. You can pull back spiritual bypassing or, right? Uh, so that you lose, if you lose the valence machinery, if you lose the dynamic coupling, then you're losing agency. And, yeah. then, and, and, and then here's, I, I think something all er, any Buddhist should agree to, like talking about freedom without, you know, talking about agency makes no sense. And the Buddha said, no matter where you taste my teaching, it's a teaching of freedom, right? And it, that, is, that is not the same thing as numbing. Freedom mm -hmm. is overcoming the loss of agency by enhancing agency in some yeah. powerful manner. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you might not be a self, but you're still a person. 
and yes. uh, the rich landscape of affordances should still be available to you. I don't think any practitioner in their right mind would say suddenly the world doesn't afford in any way whatsoever. That doesn't make any sense. Why no. would you go and teach? Why would you go and teach anyone? Why would the Buddha go on to teach a sermon if, if nothing afforded? It, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and the, the amazing Buddha, thing- and, and, and it can't be the case because the Buddha can still uh, go here rather than there. He can still right. walk down a road. Right. He can talk to right. this person in this right. way and then right. this person right. in that way. Right. In fact, right. you can still that, you, his skillfulness does not go down in the way the depersonalization uh, you know, really impacts on people's skillful interaction with the world. Uh, Absolutely. And you know, uh, this isn't a new idea, but approaching these ideas from this framework really brings it up and out. Mindfulness is not dispassion. No. I mean, mindfulness isn't cessation of events. That's not mindfulness, right? Mindfulness is sharp, powerful scrutiny of the thing so that you can really understand what it's about. So the power of awakening, if this, is, if this model is right, is that you come to a much greater understanding of what the system is yes, rather than yes. a cessation of the system. Any cessation event that you have, and of course there are cessation events, they come through a rich understanding of the model rather yeah. than a suffocation of the model. And I mean, that should just make, I know it sounds totally obvious, but lots of the ways that people teach mindfulness today, it's not made completely obvious. Well, that, that's exactly, understanding. No, this is I, understanding. I, I, uh, exactly. This, yeah. Because you know, I, you know, I, I I think you know I published with Leo uh, Ferraro, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 reformulating the mindfulness construct, and I and I've been trying to get off, you know, a sort of standard models, uh, you know, which are featureless and that's bad theoretic. There's all kinds of, but the, I've been trying, and, and I thank you for invoking the language. I've been trying to reframe uh, mindfulness in terms of you know, well, two kinds of shift: transparency, opacity shift. And also, uh, you know, feature all gestalt shifts, because that's also being trained. And I think that also has something to do uh, with people, you know, so not only you're stepping back and looking at it, you're, you're trying to become aware of this up down dynamic recursivity that we've been talking about so much through this. And that's why you can see these two axes uh, constantly being at work, uh, you know, and people are, uh, are doing practices uh, where they're moving in different ways between these dimensions. And so, yeah. I mean, sorry, I'm just a little bit happy. No, uh, because, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's kind great. of, it's it, 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 it's a convergence argument with an, uh, an argument I was making because the thing that was bothering me about the standard sort of Kabat-Zinn understanding of mindfulness is it gave me, it gave no explanation of why this would afford insight. Why would right. this being present and being non judge like, why is that going to afford insight, right? But, what, what's, like, but if you start talking about transparency, opacity shifting, and featural gestalt shifting, that's exactly the movements of attention that the insight literature talks about. And then you get, oh, this is, this is the actual functionality, why mindfulness predicts insight, why it predicts flow, why it's associated with enhanced cognitive flexibility. And you get insight for free in a way from thinking like this because insight ends up being a side effect in a way of modeling your own Exactly. Deep predictive mechanism. So as you make something transparent into being opaque, um, an automatic shift occurs, which is it falls out of the self model because now it's something that you are able to model. It's, it's no longer silently driving the system, which is what we take to be a self. Rather, it comes out. And actually, the question is, how deep in our own predictive machinery can we render things opaque? Well, this is what That's I wanted to bring question, up. But it's deep. Well, this is what I wanted to bring up because you can think of Right. You can, so you know, some of the language I've used, you can think about insight at the level of reframing a problem. Right. And then you can move to this higher order, which John Wright calls sensibility transcendence, which is starting to get what you're talking about. Not just the reframing of the problem. I call it transframing, because what you're mm -hmm. doing is actually reframing the reframing mechanism, which is right. a different. So that's a transframing because it's got transformation and transcendence in it. Right. And then you can start to think, oh, but this is like the con is this. Could, could you think, uh, well, think about Piagetian stage development. And the idea here is the child isn't having a single insight, right, into this. The child is getting a systemic or a systematic yeah. insight that, yeah. right, because they found, a, a, they found a pattern of error over which they can have a, right? And insight. so you can, get, you can get a systemic, systematic insight that's also at the level of transframing. And you can see that happening in development. 
And then that opens up the possibility that something deeply analogous to how the child becomes the adult can be what happening and how the adult can become the sage. And I think that is just wonderfully tasty at a deep epistemic level. We have to talk about this more because uh, the local the local framework where you're just saying um, uh, insight being a reframing of the problem. I mean, there's an important affective story there to be told, I'm yeah, sure, yeah, because yeah, the affective yeah. dynamics are setting precision on one way of seeing. Yeah, so yeah. as soon as those are more flexible and more dynamic, because they're not being set automatically, but rather just being information in the system, of course, you're going to expect that the frame is going to be much looser. So well, this well, is where you get cognitive reframing you know, and well-being today, because you're not getting what affectivity normally does is it locks you into an intentional stance. Exactly. Right. Well, see, think about the child suffering, the four-year-old suffering conservation problems. It, you know, Piaget's account, and, and for, you know, some of the criticisms of Piaget, although I think Zach Stein is right, North, North American psychology has tended to underread Piaget, right? Um, but, you know, you know his, his idea of centration, the child is making super salient one variable, like in, in, uh, in the number conservation, the, the, the space taken up is being made, made super salient at the expense of other variables. Like, yeah, but how much of that space is candy filled space, right? Because that's what you, <laughs> right, right, right. And so what adults do is they, they have an insight, right, which, which isn't just about candies, it's about pay attention to more interacting variables when you're trying to size up a situation. And they generalize that. And that's exactly the, ana well, that's not an analogy, that's an instance of what I think we're, we're talking about here now. And then the idea is, you know, a, a, a meditative and a contemplative practice and also a mindful movement practice. You need a whole, there's the other problem with the mindfulness take, right? We've lost the ecology of practices that are so necessary if we're gonna get into the depths of the self machinery, into that deep evolutionary depth, right? We, a little, like, oh, I'm gonna sit for 20 minutes and come, but that's not gonna be enough to do this kind of transformation. Uh, and you see the same thing in, in the Socratic Platonic tradition. You know, right from so so Socrates, you know, uh, you know, questioning and, and then the probing and this Socratic self-knowledge all the way Indeed. up to Neoplatonic dialectic, you see, you know, not identical, but you see convergent sets of ecologies of practices. And I think what you're helping to do is you're helping to give, I think, a scientifically bona fide explanation of why we would expect and predict such convergence. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And just a, just a, I don't know if this is a bit too far, but a little bit icing on this conversational cake. Um, uh, this is, and now, uh, you know, this is, this is of course is speculative, but this is one of the ways that I've been thinking about it. And I think it's, I think it's very interesting and it suits our conversation, but awakening then uh, from this perspective, uh, there's some nice things to think about. There's some nice things to say. Like for instance, uh, if you have deep axiomatic beliefs, that you've, you've picked up evolutionarily. Well, yeah. whatever that belief structure is, it literally makes your world. That's the first interesting thing to say. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, one, of the, you know, one of the primary stories coming out of this framework is that you know, in a way you're hallucinating your experience because you're not taking in from the world directly, but rather yeah. you're creating for yourself your reality from the top down, which means the things you believe really matter. I think that's such an important takeaway from this framework is that yeah. the things you believe and the things that you uh, that you get in contact with, a big thing to think about today with internet use and social media, you know, the information you're taking in, it's, it's, it's changing the kind of thing you are. And the thing you are is literally the thing you will experience. You experience the world. Yeah. The world literally is what you expect it to be in a very real way. Yeah. So then awakening will have to be a, a matter of updating what I think are some outdated old axiomatic beliefs that we evolved along the way that no longer serve us. And how do you, how do you update them? Well, you have to get counter evidence for them. You have to render them opaque and you have to, yeah. you have to you find have counter evidence for them. You have to explore. You have to explore the possibility space that you're normally not going to explore. But so imagine, the, so one, sorry, one thing yeah, quick. Go ahead, so no, go if, ahead, go ahead. If one of the axiomatic, so for instance, if one of the axioms that we're carrying around with us, that's, that's now causing some, uh, error filled drag in our world is like, it's a, it's a zero sum game, right? You know, right, that was right. valuable at one time. So how do you adjust a belief? Cause if you adjust that belief, the amazing thing is, is that you change your whole world. 
Yes. If the belief changes, you change the model, which is literally the world you experience. How do you change that? Well, one thing you can do is you can render, you can render that opaque in a mindful yep. sort of yeah. way, but you can also just start feeding it opposite evidence, which is yep. why I yep. think loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, um, forgiveness, yep. all of these training programs yep. really yep. are ways of just amassing enough counter evidence because the the amazing thing is, is that if your brain really is an optimizing machine, if your brain and nervous system and body is an optimizing machine, then it wants to be in its optimal shape. So then all you have to do is you have to just give it enough good evidence and it will update itself. It doesn't want to keep bad suboptimal beliefs. You're, it's such, only a keeping them because, You're such a Platonist. That's such a right? platonic thing to it's say. only <laughs> keeping them because they're useful. And yeah. the second you can show it a better way of being, it's an optimizing deep system. It will pick up the thing you're showing it. So no wonder love and kindness is such a powerful thing. You spend an hour a day, 15 minutes a day doing love and kindness practices. All you're doing is feeding counter evidence to some deep held beliefs. And if, if enough comes in, the system will shift. Well, that's great. That's per, like, first of all, that was beautiful. And you're such that, 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 that sort of deep platonic idea, right? Uh, that, that, that uh, you know that that, that uh, we translate it as knowledge, but epistemy mm. actually is more like understanding. You know, mm. uh, understanding is virtue, but in this profound way, it doesn't mean like oh. theoretical understanding. But it's true. Right. Given yeah. this framework, that's true. <laughs> right. Understanding is virtue. Yes. Like to be a good knower is to be a good liver in a way, because living is all about is. I mean, if you well, take knowing in the broad sense of being in a certain structure. Here's where you can play with the double meaning of virtuosity. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. uh, one thing about that, and then uh, yeah. what, uh, 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 I mean, given the way we've been talking about this, and this is the platonic notion, it, it, especially the neoplatonic notion, not only are you changing you, right, and your world, you're actually disclosing real patterns in the world that are otherwise unavailable to you. And this goes against the Cartesian, so the Cartesian no notion is, I, I, all I like, so the ancient and medieval notion is there are some truths, and I'm using truth in a very broad sense here, I don't mean propositional. There are some truths that are not, that require transformation in order for us to gain access to them. And you yeah. were just talking about that there. Yeah. C compared to like a Cartesian model, whereas, no, no, as long as I have this method, this method is universal. It, it will give me all knowledge that is possible to be, to, to be uh, achieved. Yeah. So first of all, you're bringing in something that I think is very important, which is no, 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 it, it makes sense given that I, I, and we're both admitted we're on sort of the speculative edge here, but it's plausible speculation rather than grandiose. It's like, no, 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 given the reciprocal opening idea, it's that the world is now going to, if you'll allow me a metaphor, speak to you and call to you in ways it hasn't before. And patterns are going to be available to you, I would say, made relevant to you rather than shuffled off as perpetually as irrelevant they now can grab you in, 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 in the, it's not only that here if you allow me a metaphor it's not only that you grab the world in a new way the world grabs you in a new way i it's it's exactly the way that i think about these things so i think yeah. that's exactly right. and you know you can imagine why that becomes easier the wiser you become yeah. if what yeah. we mean by wisdom is you've sufficiently modeled and so understood various layers of your own functioning so that you've opened up this sort of metacognitive ability, this metacognitive space where you have much more control. And the way you, if that's right, and the way you grip with the world there again is gonna be lightened. It's yes. going to be a much lighter affair. It's not gonna be driven unconsciously and so stuck in one style, but in the same ways you notice that pleasure and pain are information for the system. And when you really know that, then you can choose a little bit more how to respond, not in every case, but you know, you can choose a little bit more how to respond given these things. Once you've modeled precision enough, yeah. Yeah. then you have a little bit more control over where your attention goes. But imagine the same thing is gonna be with the grip you have with the world, which is uh, what prevents us from getting a good fit with the world. And often it's because we have a bad belief set which bumps up against the way certain things actually work. And so we are constantly struggling with the world to make it fit our own image, the image that we are running of ourselves. As that becomes lighter, I can just imagine that that dynamic is gonna be much looser. If it's looser, what I basically mean is you're more willing to update relative to the kinds of things that you're encountering in the world. 
Right. Imagine right. what that would be like if you weren't yeah. so stuck trying to be in one kind of organization, but you were much more flexible, much more willing to meet the world and update relative to the world. Imagine the kinds of harmonies that might emerge. So one of the things I, I mean, we're running out of time here, so maybe we can mm. have another, I'd like to have an, uh, another with you and move to Love that. Uh, these mystical higher states of consciousness uh-huh. and the epistemological problem. Uh, but uh, uh, like, because what, one of the things that uh, I've been sort of arguing and proposing is, well, that what's happening in this state is kind of meta optimal gripping that, That's so right. what you're getting is you're flowing, but the expertise you're flowing in isn't this skill or this skill, but this metacognitive kind of thing that we've been talking about. So if you'll, if you'll allow me to turn the self into a verb, you're, you're flowing in selfing, you're in self-worlding. That's, that's where the flow is happening. And so although, you know, it's, in, it's ineffable and it th- doesn't fit into your existing framework, it's not driving you crazy because that's the other thing we've we got to talk about, right? It's not, you're not going crazy and insane because these people come out and the thing that really, really is provocative and tasty is normally we do this. Here's my sort of overarching intelligible intelligibility framework. And I have this weird state, a dream. Oh, it doesn't fit in. Therefore, that's the illusion. But when people have these higher states of consciousness, even though they can't talk about it because it's ineffable, they'll say that single one shot event that doesn't fit in with everything else, that was more real. And it calls all of this into question. And oh, I've been tra- right. And, and, and I think the language we've been working out here can say, they they might not be saying something kooky. They might be saying something that is that we can explain and then actually justifies their claim. Not insofar as they make grandiose metaphysical claims, but insofar as they are becoming comprehensively wiser in yeah. some fashion. Please let's meet again and talk about that. So, it's it's I love that. Well, let's let's we'll, 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 once we shut off the recording, we'll we'll, we'll pick a date. Here's cool. one thing I wanted to sort of, and again, uh, just to be clear, if we're if language, I mean, so when you're using belief, again, you're using it. So a standard model of belief is a propositional attitude. It's a, an assertion yeah, of a proposition, this. and that's not what you mean. So when no. you would be as happy as also using things like skills, states of oh. mind, right, models of self, all of these. So you're not when you're using belief. You, you're using it as a stand-in for all of that. Is that I mean, is that if you, fair? exactly. If you're thinking about this framework in an embodied way, yeah. then um, really all we are is stacks of beliefs running from deep yeah. and yeah. wide beliefs that we've held for billions of years in our evolutionary, um, you know, phenotypy, all the yeah. way down to very quick momentary changes in belief, meaning our changes in our uh, discrete perceptual experience. And so the idea is, is that you are just a bundle of expectations, that that's just what the brain and body is. It is just a hierarchical layer of expectations that cashes out as brain stuff and nervous system stuff right, and right. body right. dynamic stuff. But it really is just, you can conceptualize it just as layers of expectation. And I like that for thinking about uh, well, contemplative makes- science because yeah then it really makes sense why understanding is liberation, why knowledge would be freedom. Because you're talking then about getting the right kind of organization, getting the right knowledge is to have the right kind of organization. And it's also to have the right kind of experience because your experience is being generated from the top down based on the kinds of things that you expect. Well, I want to talk talk to you about that in our next conversation too. I want to talk to you about the, the, what this model is saying about the deep interpenetration of perception and imagination that imagination is just the top down of perceptions, bottom up in an identical. Way. It's the exact what, same thing according to this yeah, framework. Yeah, Dreams, what, imagination, perception. And what that what that tells us about the imaginal as as something different from the imaginary. So let's talk. Let's set a date to talk about the mystical yeah. and the imaginal, um, <laughs> given these two frameworks. Yeah, great, great. So and then and then we'll talk about how about this three. We'll talk about the mystical and the imaginal as it pertains to meaning in life and wisdom. And now that we've got this framework really articulated well in this uh, video, then we can go on to talk about uh, these topics that you and I both are are, are very, very deeply interested in. I love it, John. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, I always like to give my guests, uh, you know, the, the, the final word other than me saying thank you that right. And I'll right. Is there anything sort of, you know, parting words, uh, 
summative or, or cumulative that you want to say here, or, or, or do you feel that this is sort of a, a nice place of, of closure for us to, to end with? Yeah, I might just say one extra thing, and I've already said it, but you know, since we've opened the space and it's a chance to highlight it, I think it's really important that if this cognitive science family is getting close to something that's really going on, then it makes it incredibly important that we expose ourselves to the right kinds of things because yep. you are yep. making your world. Yep. So the things that you believe, that makes your world. It's not the other way around. So yep. it's so important to be thinking about what you believe and if be thinking about how can you update your beliefs. Um, I don't know if you've heard of super forecasters before. Have you heard no. of super forecasters? No. Oh, so no. This is a kind of new thing, but um, there are people in the world who are really good at predicting. Okay. Yep. And, yep. Uh, and actually there's competitions all over the world where you can go. And it's actually something you can learn too, yep. where they give you a noisy data set and then you predict how it'll be. And then you get, yep. you can compete with teams yep. and by yourself. Right, right. Okay. I know this is a little bit of a metaphor, but I, I, I dig it that you can look at how super forecasters are good at what they do. And I've been thinking about what does that tell us about us? Because right. we are right. also prediction machines. Yep. And what does being a good predictor in that situation what sorts of virtues could you draw out of that for us? Yes, and I like yes. two, I like two in particular. Super forecasters, the best at this kind of thing, share two characteristics in common. One, they are uh, massively curious. High so need curious for cognition. I was going to say, need for cognition has to be high in these people. So yes. they like they like lots of fields. They're interested in lots of stuff. Yes, 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 that's the one thing. So they're polymaths. They don't get stuck in one way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They're interested in, in gaining information yeah. and looking yep. at lots of They've stuff. They've complexified. They've complexified. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then you lose that fragility. And two, they have installed. So this is not in predictive processing language. They have installed a high level belief that says that all of the rest of your beliefs are only relatively true. I know so that I do not know. Have, this you is should the never have, yeah. you should never have, uh, you should never have a radically high precision on any of your beliefs because beliefs aren't like that. They yeah. are updating along the way and there is no, there is no end goal in anything you believe. So you, you'll know if you meet somebody like that, because when you tell them something that goes against their belief structure, they don't lock down and become defensive. No, They're the no. kind of person who goes, wait, what? Yeah. Where yeah. did you read that? Where did you read that? Tell me yeah. more. Yeah, wow, it works like that. It doesn't, because I thought it worked like that. No, it <laughs> works like that. Wow. <laughs> that right there will protect you a lot from the kinds of pathological self-organizations that can emerge in these kinds of systems. We don't have time today. Maybe we can talk about it next time. But yeah. one of the shared features of psychopathology from this perspective is you lock down in some predictive dynamic and you fail to update relative to new yeah. information. Yeah. The way All you right. can protect yourself from that is be curious and be humble intellectual humility and you are curiosity. describing socrates but i would make, <laughs> i would make you know and his wisdom is that he knew and he didn't mean abstractly he knew when he did not know but he right. also knew what to care about relative to that right which right, right. And, 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 but i i would i would i would want to make a distinction given what we said earlier between mm. curiosity which i think is very much in the having mode and has to do with filling in a missing piece of information versus what the kind of systemic, systematic kind of insight that these people are seeking. And that's more, Fuller makes this distinction. That's more like, and I mentioned this to you, that's more what wonder is. And Socrates was saying that wisdom begins in wonder because wonder and awe, this is really important. And this goes back towards your depersonalization versus you know, wisdom, the, the private versus the superlative. Mo when most situations, when people feel the self is shrinking, they feel that is deeply, deeply negative and they dislike it. But if you mm -hmm. put people into wonder and awe and ask them about the sense of self, it is shrinking, but they view it as overwhelmingly positive. Fascinating. So they're not trying to protect themselves from the world anymore so that that shrinking is a problem. You're but right. rather they're, they're open, they're open yes. some way into the world. And so the shrinking is actually benefiting their openness. So in think, some about way. It, think about it this, curiosity is trying to answer a question. Wonder is trying to call as much as it can into question. <laughs> so, you know, we can just leave it on this point. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing that we're most interested in doing now. You yeah. might think given this framework that we want to have no prediction error. 
but actually, the, because you're saying we're prediction error minimizing machines, but actually the truer thing to say is you're not trying to have no prediction error, but a good optimal, healthy, well-being related predictive machine is trying to find the right kinds of errors yep. to make itself the best kind of thing it can be. And so that's our, that's our current project is starting to think about what errors are valuable and how do we, in a metacognitive way, start selecting the right kinds of errors to engage with rather than trying to get away from errors? What is the incredible value of uncertainty for yeah, yeah. a prediction error minimizing machine? There's so much to talk about there and how that's analogous to stuff happening in the philosophy of science. So let's, let's just, because we'll just keep going for hours and hours and hours. So, uh, well, let, so we're, we're committed. We'll, we'll, we'll set up a time. The mystical... How about the mystical, the imaginal, and the sapiential? So we're gonna, we're gonna we'll, we'll talk about that next time. So Love thank it. you so very, very much, Mark. Thank you. And I, and I look forward to our next conversation uh, together. Great. Great. Thanks so much.